I feel like we should probably go ahead and get started if everybody is ready. Um, again, no pressure. You don't have to turn on your camera, but we love seeing everybody's faces. Uh, let's start with uh, my introduction and, and our speakers today. Um, I am Amanda Faults. I am an archivist at the City Archives, which are at New Orleans Public Library. Uh, we are giving, this is the last session in our four-week presentation, uh, Who Gets to Vote, which is a program that was uh, uh, brought to us by the Louisiana Endowment for Humanities in conjunction with the um, Andrew Mellon Foundation, as well as the State Council of Humanities. Uh, so what we've been doing these past four weeks is discussing various voting issues. And today we're going to be discussing um, felon disenfranchisement in America. It's a, it's a huge thing. It's, it's disenfranchised millions of people, often for um, you know, arrests and incarcerations that are completely based in racist um, laws that, for things that should have been misdemeanors or you know, should not have been criminally punishable at all. Um, Today, we were, uh, Voice of the Experienced reached out to us to um, come and give uh, a co-hosting, a presentation for us today about more recent events, um, especially since 2016. They've played a major role in re-enfranchising um, uh, former felons and incarcerated persons. And, uh, and we've, we're gonna hear from some more about them from like their history, from like, especially the 2016 lawsuit onward to today. And then um, also uh, our co-host for the four weeks has been uh, Professor Low Faber. Uh, we've greatly appreciated his guidance and um, leading of all the discussions. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce Riley and Chico Yancey of Vote, Voice of the Experienced in a moment. But um, I, I will say we definitely encourage discussion. Uh, like I said before, you can click on the raise hand um, thing in Zoom or you can type into chat. Uh, and if you type it into chat, I'll do my best to like read it, insert it into the conversation. But with that all being said, uh, I would love to turn it over to uh, Bruce and Chico to get today started. First, first of all, go ahead, Bruce. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, Amanda, Lo, and, and everybody. Um, you know, my name is Bruce Riley. I'm the deputy director at Voice of the Experienced. Um, we have four chapters throughout the state in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and Shreveport, um, kind of in that order of sort of how big and established uh, we originally sort of formed up here in, in New Orleans uh, on the outside. And, and Chico can tell you a little bit more about how we got our, our beginnings. Um, and so now we have grown into sort of a full-fledged civil rights, social justice, this organization that's that's grassroots and impact uh, led by directly impacted people. Myself, I did 12 years in prison. Uh, I did five years on parole. Did about 15 years. I kind of have to recalculate each time uh, on probation. And so, basically, my whole life has been spent uh, under under government supervision. And before that, you know, foster homes and, and things like that. So it. The, you know, the, one of the big points of our, of our organization, you know, the reason why we're the voice of the experienced is because you see things a little bit differently depending on where you're standing and what's impacting you. And so we bring that um, to the, the conversation around criminal justice reform. And I think that folks that have seen some movement on the needle over the last decade, uh, people that are close to that needle moving, I think will universally credit the work of vote as a primary mover and catalyst and a hub of all those activities. Uh, it's not by accident that our, our acronym is vote. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of those things. I just want to turn it over to, to Chico and maybe he can give us a little, little background on, on where vote came from. First of all, good morning, everyone. Hope everybody have a great day so far. Uh, my name is Sheko Yancey. Uh, I spent 20 years in Angola. Originally, I had a life sentence. Uh, my sentence was commuted in 1995 by former uh, Governor Edwards, and uh, I still had to wait eight more years to be, I was eligible for parole. So when people hear that eligibility, that's all it means. Everybody on this call is eligible to buy a Jaguar but you qualify you know so 
you know, and, and that's where people get hung up. But Norris Henderson is our executive director and as Bruce introduced himself as the deputy, uh, you know, Norris and I were in prison together in Angola and we, you know, we, we got a memo, we read something one day about people saying, you know, people gonna burn down the prisons and this wasn't going right. And, and Norris has been, and Biggie, another guy, Kenny Johnston, uh, we all got together and we were trying to figure out, we didn't get that memo about burning the prison down. You know, that's not what we want to do. You know, we're, we're trying to find a way to get out of prison, don't want to be comfortable in prison, but uh, we needed to find a way out. So we, uh, after discussing it and getting with several groups on the inside and for people that don't know about inside prison, each club has a self-help group, uh, you have the Lifers Association, you have the Human Relations Club, you have the Drama Club, you have churches, all of that. And uh, we got together and decided to uh, do something and get our families involved because it had just come out, uh, Governor Roma at that time was in and he said, corrections is a growth industry. Well, we realized, damn, this is this is about. I heard somebody was talking earlier about the slave plantation. Well, eighteen thousand acres in Angola. Eighteen was owned by Major James. That's where it actually started. Okay, that was a slave plantation, and uh, we got together and we formed uh, the Angola Special Civics Project. And I was sharing with uh, Amanda earlier. Uh, the civics project was basically going back to when you're in eighth grade or early freshman or ju uh, sophomore in high school, learning what civics is. You know, learning how the government works, learning how all these things work. And uh, we got together with all, all the groups and we formed the Angola Special Civics Project. And we were uh, interested in getting our families and, and, and friends involved in uh, getting people elected because changing the laws actually starts with the legislature. That's who make these laws and everything. So we decided what what a way that we could do and do this. Now, mind you, in prison, in prison, nobody could picture. It sounded like this would be good. It wasn't causing any harm. Uh, we didn't have a meet. We meet on the yard and on the back of the building and. And then the officers, the guards would come and what are you guys doing? Y'all trying to start a riot and all this. And, and you can't pitch it in prison. Out here, you're kind of free to say what you want to do what you want to do. They would kick out bed at two or three o'clock in the morning and bring you that dog place that nobody knew where you was, your family didn't know where you was, and curse you and attempt to beat you and all of these things about. What are you trying to do? And it took us about a year and a half to let the administration know the only thing that we were trying to do is educate ourselves, educate our families and friends. Uh, we actually uh, formed a, uh, uh, had our outside people to form the LCSPR, the Louisiana Coalition for Penal Reform. And uh, that is what we did to learn how to change things. Fast forward, uh, one night, Norris is giving a presentation about how important our voting rights were. He had did a lot of research on having the right to vote when you come out of prison. And uh, we didn't know that at that time, Representative Naomi Warren was in the audience. And uh, we thought, we write a bill. And we was, we was just so happy we wrote a bill. But we didn't have, un <laughs> didn't have, <laughs> <laughs> the knowledge to know that you had to have somebody to file that damn bill, okay? And uh, so she was there and she said, I'll take that upon myself to do. Uh, and it was the first, first bill we wrote was the 2045 to get men and women out that they would be eligible for parole after serving a term of 20 years and over the age of 45, because that was the the talking point out outside here that when you became 45 years old, your criminal menopause, uh, you know, you was less likely to commit another crime. So that's how we actually started. Uh, and we've come a long way. The Civics Project is still on the inside. Uh, it is still going strong. That organization is still going. But NARS, uh, uh, Kenny, uh, 
Bruce, myself, and several other people, uh, you know, brought on the outside the civics project. Now it's called the voice of the experience. And, you know, before it was the voice of experience, it was the voice of the ex-offenders. And that's a term that I hate, offender, you know, because they call you, when I went to prison, you were convict. And then they came with inmate. And then now they use the word offender. Offender means that you are still offending to me. So we like to be called, and for everybody on this on this video today, FIP, former incarcerated person. And inside of people is CIPs, currently incarcerated people. So uh, hopefully that you will get a new language for yourself today and understand that you don't call people felons, you don't call people all these other names and everything. We are former incarcerated people and you know, uh, inside is the CIP. So Bruce has just put it in the chat. So hopefully, uh, you know, we got a lot more to do today. And I uh, just wanted to give you a little tidbit of how we actually got started. And as Bruce said, you know, we were in a little building uh, on St. Bernard, then we moved into an office on St. Bernard. And now uh, I'll save that to later to give you where we are right now. We have an office in Baton Rouge, uh, Lafayette and Shreveport. And by the way, I think Bruce did say it, all of our offices are run by FIPs, former incarcerated people. We go to the legislature, we do all this work that we're trying to do to change things. And uh, in 2019 of March uh, was my first time being able to vote. But that is another stumbling block that we'll talk about later. So uh, at that, I'll just shut up because uh, I could go on and on about this because as I'm thinking and speaking, it just comes up in my head how far we've come to do what, the kind of work we're doing. Thank you. Yeah, Chico, well, we'll uh, I'm sure we're going to, we'll probably be weaving in lots of uh, little details, of, of, you know, related, um, but, you know, maybe we'll just jump back into this issue uh, that's known as, as felon disenfranchisement um, okay. for a bit and, and, and bring it out from there. Um, and just start by, by letting folks know, if, if you don't know, um, there's over 5 million Americans that are, that are disenfranchised due to a felony conviction. So, you know, you can imagine if, if there were something where you're, you're fighting on behalf of a thousand people or 10,000 people or 50,000 people, but you were ignoring 5 million people if you're one of the 5 million, it, it's, it's kind of offensive. You know, it's sort of like, excuse me, you think there's a problem over here, but you're like missing this huge problem over there. And so this has been something where, like all oppressions, um, if you're not the one experiencing it, you can kind of keep on moving. And so, but if you are experiencing it, you don't really have an op option, but, but to fight for your place to stand. Um, but, you know, all those laws really have a root in racism. And, you know, the status quo has lots of, of, of racism, you know, percolating throughout the laws, but we have these people who inherit the laws generation after generation and feel this reverence to the law, right? Like, oh, well, we can't change things. Like, well, well, and sort of this assumption that the law must be there, even like some decent people, right? The non-racists, uh, the law must have been created with some, you know, some wisdom and there's a reason for it and it's, it protects us. And so we have to, to peel back uh, a lot of those myths and, and such. And you know, some credit definitely uh, belongs to um, uh, Chris Uggen and Jeff Manza, who wrote the, the book that is, is uh, listed within the, the um, what do you call that, sort of the, the library's curriculum that, that is being you know, pushed out there. And, and it's, a great, it's a great tool to kind of get the conversation started. And there are two academics who really started looking into this. Um, probably about, I think their first publications are maybe around 20 years ago now. Um, and then some credit, you know, definitely also goes to the sentencing project who kind of picked up a lot of the, 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 the detail. And, and that's an organization that got started, you know, at a time when there was bipartisan desire to increase all these sentences across, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and there was really nobody pushing back. And a lot of the civil rights organizations that, that you know, we kind of knew of in the 60s and 70s had either been decapitated, literally, or assimilated. 
And so there was, you know, there was this idea of like the, um, the good folks you could fight for. And then the, the, the not good folks that were like, we're not going to talk about them. So once someone got convicted, that became the proxy for racism, right? Now we're, now we're doing like race neutral stuff, right? We're only going after people with convictions. We're not going after people, uh, you know, who are, who are black, but we know that by policing patterns, we try to throw convictions onto people of color, right? Including the reservations, you know, where, where, where Native Americans live, right? So all these, all these delicate areas that are highly policed, which the crazy thing is the whole invention of felon disenfranchisement was a tactic to get around racism, right? It was intentionally, you know, and, and overtly spoken about as a way to strip people of their rights by convicting them, by fabricating crimes and, and, and or letting people go for let's say understandable crimes committed by a white man. But if they were convicted by a black person, you know, they would, they would, be, uh, they would be thrown in, in jail and then lose their voting rights forever, right? So it was totally a, a, a not well hidden tactic. And yet here we were in the 80s and 90s and 2000s replicating that same tactic of like, well, you know, if you're convicted of a crime, you, you, you can't get, um, you know, college aid. If you're convicted of a crime, you, you can't uh, live in this, this public housing anymore. You know, the whole family is gonna get kicked out. You're gonna, um, you're not gonna be able to, to get food stamps and all these different things that was all about being convicted of a crime, but we know that the crimes are being applied to people of color disproportionately. And anytime someone says, well, what do you mean the system's racist? I always remind them that if you try to pick out, here we are in New Orleans, the greatest concentration of drug use in New Orleans, you're gonna come up with Tulane and Loyola. You're gonna come up with a place that's about 90% white, right? Where the, where the folks living there are gonna be between like 18 and 24. I went to law school at Tulane, rampant drug use, no surprise to anybody just like Wall Street, no surprise to anybody, rampant drug use, right? And yet you don't see the doors getting kicked in. But if you go a mile away, whereas the black kids in Central City, same age group, they're getting pulled over and frisked. They're getting their car searched. They're getting their door kicked in. All those things for the same behavior. And they're seen as like a no good drug user or whatever, whereas the kids are experimenting at Tulane. And they're, you know, they're, they're letting some stress out or whatever the case may be. So, and then, you know, go down to, to Tulane and Broad where all the lawyers and judges live and ask them about their own personal history of, of drug use, uh, which may not be so historic. So I, I think it's, I think it's, it's clearly that the drug war has been used as, as the, the Klan's greatest tactic that beyond their wildest imagination. And so all these, these rulings around uh, around convictions and then how that applies to the rest of your life, what we call mass incarceration, is something that just propped up in all these different, you know, like I'm looking at my garden, like all these like different plants, you know, and you got to play like whack-a-mole to try to knock them down. But a lot of it all is rooted in the original right, which is the right to vote. And if I take that away, you're not going to be able to fight back on all these other rights. And so it's important to look at the history. And in Louisiana, one of the key parts of the history, one of the, I think the most glaring components of understanding this law is when only white men could vote, there was felon disenfranchisement, but it was limited to four crimes, bribery, forgery, perjury, and high crimes and misdemeanors. My cat totally wants to jump on my computer. So, uh, so those four crimes all arguably could be related to stuffing a ballot box in the 1800s, right? And so the idea that what we now would use a phrase like rationally related, right? Is there, is there a relationship between this crime, there, get out of here, <laughs> between this crime and the thing that we're trying to, to, to work around and prevent. So, but in 1865, when voting rights expanded to black men, and of course they needed some laws to kind of catch up with that, right? They're, you know, we can change the constitution, but then 
constitutions themselves are not laws, right? So now you have to have laws that follow a constitution. And so they then changed it to, and there's a, there's a, a, a long and tortured process. And um, it's funny, someone else's cat's getting there too. <laughs> yeah, <I'll see. laughs> Those pesky Zoom cats. What about us? Um, but those the 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 long and tortured uh, laws that that I, I really highlighted in a in a, a law review article that I wrote uh, called "To Purify the Ballot: The Racial History of Felon Disenfranchisement in Louisiana." Um, and the reason why I I used "To Purify the Ballot" is because in the Louisiana Constitution of 1898, when they really like crushed voting rights opportunities for black people by any means necessary. And one of the things they did up to that was they saw illiterate white folks as collateral damage for the greater good, which was to purify the ballot and make sure that only white people can vote. And so a lot of folks don't know that in Louisiana, although black people had the right to vote in the 20th century, up until uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, less than 10% of, of people were actually able to cast the ballot, black people. Right, and so you can imagine this, that structural racism, what was able to be accomplished over generations, right? So we talk about sometimes intergenerational wealth and that, that sort of thing, uh, the intergenerational political power, and then what one might have to do to get in that smaller 10% to be able to cast the ballot. And then the threats that people face. I'm gonna turn it over to, to Chico in a moment, but I just wanted to put one, name in your in your your minds and that name is crystal mason and we think about rosa parks uh and and other icons of the civil rights movement i want you to remember crystal mason she's a woman in texas who uh, you may recall from national news a couple of years ago got sentenced to five years in prison for being on probation for like a tax issue case i think it was like tax fraud or something something you know maybe any of us could face at any given time based on, you know, oops. Um, but she got five years in prison and her defense was, I actually didn't know that I didn't have voting rights on probation. And so here we are, you know, all the hard work of, of Uggen and Manza, all of our hard work, all of other people's hard work around the country. And these laws have been really vague and untalked about, right? And so it can be really, and if you're, I mean, you sent, judge sends you to probation, nobody told you about your voting rights. And so the good news uh, is Crystal has been out on appeal for this time. And the, the Texas uh, Board of Appeals just mentioned, uh, I wanna say it was like well, this past week, maybe it was Monday or something like that, um, that they're gonna hear her appeal. And so she's actually become a, a huge advocate in Texas. And they have about 500,000 people who are disenfranchised citizens in Texas. Um, I'm going to talk more about some of the what's going on in other states. I want to give Chico a chance to, to maybe talk about uh, how our lawsuit really was, was used to, to kick off our work here in, in Louisiana. Uh, you know, when Bruce gives that, uh, and I was taking notes and everything, and I thought about when he was talking about people that are disenfranchised. Uh, Females, you know, uh, we're in prison. I never forget we we uh, Norris and we got got a movie or uh, documentary to show that the suffrage rights. So we, we this is nothing new. Of talking about uh, you know people trying to get the right to vote, you know, and and uh, and having a, a right to go to the ballot box, cast your vote, and uh, for who you wanted to, not for what they wanted to, but what who you wanted to uh, to. To vote, you know, to, to vote in office, you know, but we filed a lawsuit uh, a few years back uh, to actually change this, uh, to find out about how come we couldn't vote, what was the problem, and the disenfranchisement, the racism, and, you know, uh, the lawsuit, it, it went, we still got it, you know, kind of pending like, but then uh, we met a, a state representative named Pat Smith. And uh, we realized that, you know, to change this, we had to do it in the legislature. If the courts don't give it to us, we went in the legislature and do it. Uh, because when you read the Constitution and, and people 
And guess what? Back in those days, they didn't have a problem with saying, we're going to do this constitutionally and disenfranchisement and preserve the white supremacist race. I mean, that is in the Constitution that they didn't have a problem with saying those things. And we realized, oh, damn, we got to do something different. So that's what, you know, we, we, we got our people together and did everything we needed to do. And it took five years, five years for this bill to actually uh, become a law, you know, and, you know, there's so much rich history behind this that, you know, when you're dealing about why, why you can't vote, why is felons disenfranchised, uh, you know, look like that the community would want, you know, when prison, when you go to prison, I did something I had no business doing. I was punished. I was corrected, rehabilitated, got a college degree when I was in prison, all of that. But when I came out on probation, I'm on parole. So there's two terms, probation and parole, and we'll talk about that later. But, you know, I have no right to say so, of say so who represents me. But I pay my taxes. So we even got to the point that in the legislature, and um, uh, you can go on our website, and uh, if uh, Amanda would put it up and, you know, in your spare time, just look at our, what we go on, the history and how we went. You know, and I remember testifying before the uh, Government and Mental Affairs uh, Committee that no one up here represents me, but my taxes pay your salary. My taxes pay your salary. And I remember telling the chairman of the committee, I think his name was Smith, uh, Representative Smith, that I would forego my right to vote if you decide and have to pay state or income taxes. And everybody kind of laughed and said, you know, Mr. Yancey, I, I, may, I, may, I may go for that myself, you know? But I had to testify to tell people that here I am paying my taxes, working every day, but you don't represent me. And that's what we have to realize. People don't, people in those status, they don't represent the regular folks down here on the ground. They represent the top folks. So why do you, why don't you want me to vote? And I also went into the to the realness of right now in elections, people are winning elections by one vote, four votes, twenty votes. So it looked like you would want me to vote. And I told uh, I was Representative uh, uh, Lance Harris, I told him, you know, you just won by a close election. Look like you would want people to register because guess what? I might be the one that could vote for you and get you over. So, you know, when we do all those things and, and getting into it, you know, the crime or uh, the recidivism, we have the national probation and parole people uh, nationally that said that if you give the person their voting rights, they become a part of the community. And when you become a part of a community, then my granddaughter now, she is proud of me. My family is proud of me because now I have, I have done what prison was supposed to do, punish, correct, rehabilitate. And that's what you as a taxpayer and citizen, everybody on this call have not been to prison. What do you want people that go to prison to do? You want them to be punished. You want them to be corrected. But guess what? Thousands of people come out of prison every day. And we wonder why don't they learn or why have they learned the lesson, as we say. Well, you haven't made them part of the community. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody understands that when you come out of prison, housing, jobs, and then you're looked on as scum of the earth. Scum of the earth. You know, and I know that Bruce and I, we're probably the only two people that own this whole Zoom thing. We're the only two people that ever did anything wrong. Everybody else is perfect, purified, as Bruce said, and, and you've never done anything. But some of us just didn't get caught. And when Bruce was talking, it made my mind go back to the Clinton administration. Everybody thinks Bill Clinton was a was the bomb, as young folks would say. He, he has actually started the war on the drugs. 
And then when they brought all of this money in, guess what? That had to start arresting people. As Bruce was saying, the comparison of Tulane, LSU, and all these Loyola University and all these top schools, you know, they wasn't going after those people because they had power. The crack era came in. So therefore, now that is the people that you arrest. So when you're arresting these people, you do two things. And when you read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, it just it solidified what they really wanted to do, kick your dough in, in Chicago, uh, New Orleans, all around the country, the war on drugs. Thousands of people went to prison for a little bit of crack cocaine when the guy that brought a boatload of powder here, he got 10 months. The other guy got a life sentence or the lady got a life sentence. And then they became uh, addicted to drugs and everything. I was meeting with a legislator the other day and this, this is gonna be really interesting to me because uh, it wasn't somebody we supported, but when I sit down and talk to him, he runs a, uh, a clinic and everything and he realized, you know, some of this stuff is addiction. We have addictions for everything, but if you if you have a drug, you're not addicted, you're a criminal. So, you know, when we look at all these things and I see people shaking their head and all that, but we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go because out of everything we're doing, there's other folks that's trying to right now put the nail in the coffin and back and put Jim Crow, bring it back up, and bring it back alive and make it a well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Live and well. So, you know, I mean, when we talk about the history of this and, you know, uh, looking at my notes here, you know, you know, looking at, do you even care about felons having the right to vote? Do you even care about the people that went to prison, did their time, and, you know, that they should be a part of society? And, and you know, and I'll, I'll go back and let Bruce uh, come back in and, you know, we do this all the time, bounce off each other and think about stuff. But how many of you have children that you, that they did something and you punished that child? Okay. When you sent him to his room or her room, sent him to the room and you said no TV, whatever, do you leave him in that room forever? Yes. Do you, do you leave him in there forever? And Bruce is, is laughing now because he has a daughter, you know, and, you know, he, he gave a good analogy and I won't go into that about the ice cream thing and everything, but you don't, you don't keep your child in that room forever. At some point you let that child come out. You may talk to that child and say, this is why I did this. This was for your good. You know, not my good. My grandmama used to say, hey, I'm not, I'm not, this is going to hurt me more than, you know, than hurt you. And I'm saying, damn, I'm the one getting the licking. But she, that's because she loved me and cared about me. So when you send people to prison that did something wrong, and by the way, there are thousands of people across the country that is totally innocent. Totally innocent. So now when people come back out and everything, they do their time. And now that we have a stipulation on our voting rights here in uh, Louisiana, uh, I was on, I'm on parole, I'm still on parole. So I had to be out five years. I have to go to my probation officer. They have to give me a letter. And the letter says that, hey, now you are been good. You haven't been back to prison. You haven't committed another violation. Then I have to take that to the registrar's office. And then the registrar decides, okay, we're gonna put you back on the road. You know, we're gonna probably talk later because I think that just as easy as you took me off the rolls, you should put me back on the road. And it would be so much easier because I don't think people understand. I was telling the legislature the other day that in, in the Baton Rouge area here, there's an area called Gardier. Those people, instead of going to East Baton Rouge Parish uh, probation office that has a bus line, they have to go way across the river in Port Allen. They can't do that on their lunch hour. There's no bus public service that goes over there. So therefore they make it hard. And when I'm in it's 26th district of probation and parole across the state of Louisiana. And those people are trying, some of the probation, we have to educate probation and parole about what we're trying to do. And then maybe you get the head to understand 
but you got the little officer down on the bottom that said, shucks, I ain't doing that. Shucks, I mean, I got enough to do. Why would I inform people that got the right to vote now? So all of those problems come in and what we're doing, it would be so simple that if we, once you hit that benchmark of five years, who knows better than the Department of Corrections? Why not let the computers talk? Mm -hmm. Because they don't want them to. <laughs> huh? Mm -hmm. Because they don't want them to. There you go. So if the computer's talking, anybody reached that benchmark of five years, it would be so easy to send that to the registrar's office, the secretary of state, and say this person has complied and did everything they're supposed to do. And then you can go online and, and register, or you decide to go in person, you could do it. So there's all kinds of barriers to do it. And then finally, because as I'm talking, it's always something that you think of. Uh, up in Union Parish, I'll give you a perfect example. Had a young man that uh, had been out of prison 20 years. He knew what to do. He went to probation and parole. He got his letter and he goes to the register's office. And you know what that register told that guy? If you don't get your black behind out of here, I'll call the sheriff and lock you up. So now the guy on parole, remember, he's on parole. He's working every day. He said, okay, to hell with voting. I don't want to vote because I don't want to go back to jail. And we had to actually tell the Secretary of State that, and they claim that they fixed it and things, but in those small parishes, the sheriff, the sheriff and the clerk of court, they run that in the registers voters, registers office. And by the way, the registers is not an elected office. It's an appointed office. So it stays in the family. So, you know, uh, give it back to Bruce. Anybody ask, you know, question, we can do that I later. Mean, but the more that I more that I think about this, there's so much, there's so much that goes into this that uh it's just unbelievable that people do not want you to vote. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about after this last election, you ought to see the states around the country, 43 states now is is getting ready to, to put some laws in effect to to suppress the vote again. Yeah, I want to uh, jump in on a couple of questions that, that, that Jennifer had. Um, uh, so one, you, you asked about the, the history of, of legislation, you know, around the country um, on this issue. And, you know, I think it's important, you know, basically to start with the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, which was, you know, a lot of hard work. I, I think, you know, that that story is is pretty accessible and everybody should kind of learn that and, and teach that to, to young people, um, you know, as part of the, the fight for rights and just to, always to kind of remind people that that is in, um, it's in the lifetimes of people that are still with us, you know, including people who, who are in leadership positions. And so I, I think it's, you know, this idea that like racism's dead or whatever, uh, you know, sometimes we have to kind of keep bringing up more and more examples for, for the hard, hard to hear. Um, but that, you know, basically what that, what the Voting Rights Act did um, in this context of, you know, just, and I don't wanna, you know, get it too, too legal mumbo jumbo for you at all, but one of the biggest things it did was it created this list of jurisdictions that had problems, right? And any list of the, the, this magnitude would probably start with Louisiana and, and with other places, but, the whole state has one of the, the most troubled uh, histories around racism and voting rights, uh, you know, and violence uh, in, in the country. So they had this list. And then if you were on the list, what they call covered jurisdictions, you would then have to get what's known as preclearance from the Department of Justice if you want to make any change to your voting rights. Or, or you know, like if you want to move a polling station across the, the river, uh, you would have to get pre-clearance to, to be able to show that this won't have a, a, a disproportionate impact on people of color, right? And any other provision. And so it became a pretty effective tool in fighting back a lot of these crazy bills that get, get filed. Because what was happening prior to that was the lawyers would have to chase around the laws that get impacted. And then you have to bring a case 
And so you're always doing whack-a-mole and you're always a few years behind some new change because the courts are going to run as slow. And, you know, and, and these legislatures, if they're dominated by, um, you know, by a cabal, they're going to get stuff passed. And then the, the civil rights lawyers, you know, are, are going to do their best to, to push back. And so, and, and yeah, and so, you know, uh, the, the, the point that I think was just dropped by uh, Amanda is that, you know, there, there was a Shelby case, the United States Supreme Court, that basically in 2013 held that, well, you know what, we're over it. We, we, we've made it through the wilderness. And, you know, if you could, if you were just, in, you know, wearing your, your optimistic shoes that day and you were just being like your most like pleasant and, and heartfelt, you know, you could be like, well, we have made progress. And the reality is we have. Like, I don't think anyone should be, should be pretending we, that they're, you know, that this is like we're in 1964 all over again. Otherwise, they just don't really seem to know that much about 1964. I wasn't there, but I'm a bit of a historian. So, you know, we have tools to fight back. Now it's harder to oppress. And, you know, and the thing is, the reality is we see a lot of this like kind of Trumpism, I believe, because we're getting progress. If they were winning and crushing folks, they wouldn't be so motivated and, and loud and noisy. They're, they're, there's, you know, the, the, the loudest, uh, you know, noise of the swan or whatever is when it's dying. And so we need to, to factor that into the work that we do. But so the, so the interesting thing, you know, I bring up the Voting Rights Act to then say that, um, you know, in the 1970s, there was another U.S. Supreme Court case that came out of California called Richardson v. Ramirez. And in this case, what they, what they held, and again, you know, if you have your, your, your happy, optimistic shoes on, you're, you kind of take them at their word, there was some, some value to it, right? Um, but, or from their point of view, you know, it wasn't just like done objectively unreasonable. But what they felt was the people who passed the Voting Rights Act had um, an understanding of the 13th Amendment that allows you to enslave people after they've been convicted of a crime. There's a, a piece in there, and it's still in there. That's why you might be seeing different states, Colorado for one, um, you know, put bills in. There's a bill in the Louisiana legislature. You know, we'll see what happens. Trying to change constitutional provisions to get rid of that ability to enslave folks uh, after conviction of a crime. Now, it's not like anyone's opening up a plantation to me and like, bring them on. We know that there's a government component to it now. We could get more into that. But obviously, the whole point at that time was to allow for sort of state slavery to do all the public works projects or whatever, and to all, you know, universally kind of strip all your rights once you've been convicted. And so that was in place from, from the, you know, the 1860s. So now come into the 1970s and the US Supreme Court was like, well, they didn't take that down. That still exists. So clearly the Voting Rights Act does not cover people uh, convicted of, of, of crimes, right? So, so that, that, that right that people were trying to push through Richardson, but Richardson's actually, and you know, I don't want to put too much on it. It's a very complex case. It's not as bad as people thought, but the problem was after that case, folks around the country for decades, all the way up till like very, very recently, they're like, oh yeah, you, you can't win on that issue. The Supreme Court already spoke. And we saw that there's a Rucker case uh, you know, about, um, uh, about HUD and, and housing and, and criminal convictions. And people would look at that Rucker case, and, and that's from the 2000s, and, and they would be like, oh, well, you know, Rucker. And I'm like, do you read the whole details of the case? You know, so sometimes these cases, they apply in a, in a sort of a limited fashion. And people, including lawyers, including like executive directors of like civil rights like organizations, will take that limited thing and just use it as like a blanket like well you know women can't sue for equal pay or whatever like it's over like such and such case you know and it's like man you are not who you say you are and so a lot of folks just threw in the towel on this issue for, for years 
1985, I want to say, there was a, another uh, really um, impactful case, uh, and that was Hunter v. Underwood, and that was in Alabama. And in, in that case, the, the U.S. Supreme Court held that if you can show that the whole, the reason for the disenfranchise and the reason for the conviction was flat out racist, like overtly, well, then, you know, we, then you've got like some grounds to stand on. And that was where, uh, you know, we have these phrases like crimes of moral turpitude. And so in Alabama, um, it was very overtly stated that crimes of moral turpitude were invented just as a like round up the black folks crime. Right. And so, but the problem was for, for some years after, um, after 1985 ruling, was that you didn't really, there was no like definition of what are these crimes of moral turpitude, right? It was kind of like saying, um, you know, well, these are serious crimes. What's a serious crime? And so then, you know, it was actually directly impacted people and, and Pastor Kenny Glasgow in, in Alabama is, is, you know, one of our, our colleagues. And he uh, had a, a piece of litigation was around just that, like, you know, there's a follow-up to these these little moves that, that that get traction, and sometimes you get a little piece of traction, and then if you're not impacted, you walk away like, oh well, like we we've moved on from this, and so Glasgow's uh, litigation, and there was kind of a series of litigations, and this is all like within the past, I want to say maybe about like nine years ago or ten years ago, uh, started saying like, what are these are what are these crimes, and so early 2000s, we really started to see traction on this issue in different spaces and places around the country. For myself, um, I was incarcerated actually not in Angola, but up in Rhode Island. And when I was in maximum security, you know, and, and organizing with with my brothers on the inside, um, I mean, it's kind of ironic, you know, similar to the thinking of, of Chico and Norris and others down here, it was like, you know, we really need to, to get some political footholds and, and get some rights. And so I had been researching all the things I just said about like, you know, Richardson v. Ramirez and Hunter v. Underwood and Rhode Island Constitution. And so I was getting ready to file a lawsuit when I got out on parole. But I, it was a 2005, I ended up joining up with, with some folks that were, uh, we worked on a, a constitutional amendment. And that's one of the, the things that, so and just to pause and say, there's no federal right to vote. Right, and this is one of the problems here. So the the federal constitution means that if you give somebody a right, you got to do it equally, right? And you can't have this racism. That's that's a Fourteenth Amendment thing. But it doesn't. There's nothing in the constitution that says everyone has a right to vote. And so then you have these different state constitutions, and you have different state laws, and you have different language, and you have different rulings, and so it's been difficult for folks, let's just say from, you know, you could be a voting rights lawyer in New York. Um, and if you're really gonna work on five different states over the course of, you know, five years, you're really gonna have to like learn the, the issue kind of all over again. And you're gonna have to have those local historians to work with you and, and you know, directly impacted people and, and understand the mechanics of, you know, some, other than Maine and Vermont, where everybody can vote in DC, uh, whether you're in prison or not. Other states, some you can walk out of prison and literally just register as if you're, you've never been in, you know, never got convicted of anything. Others like ours, there's these added sort of components. And so uh, in Rhode Island, we had, we had won the, uh, the ballot initiative literally by like a couple thousand votes. We got like 50 point like 6%. And we had to get 50% plus one, right? It was, and we had a strategy and, and, it, and it worked and it was led by directly impacted people. And we became the first state to, to re-enfranchise people through the, the ballot initiative. Um, I think everyone is probably, you know, to some degree aware of the Florida ballot initiative of, of, uh, of a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, question four, the yes on four campaign. And actually, I, um, I've been using my my friend's book as a, as just like a, a little note thing. This is an incredible book, "Let My People Vote" by by Desmond Mead. Um, that 
is great to read as a sort of a, a first person account of the journey um, to, to really build out a coalition, particularly a big state like Florida, in a place where I can tell you from the, from the inside and the back end, having known a lot of the voting rights community, um, you know, kind of the legal community, there were plenty of people who said, there's no way. There's no way you're gonna like move that big ball down the field. It's too much. In the same way that in 2012, 2013, when, you know, when I was a member of Vote and, you know, we were reaching out, and like I said, look, back, back in 20, 2005, 2006, I got heavily involved in voting rights. And so I met all the people, all the, you know, the big name organizations and, and some really brilliant people who've been working on voting rights cases. And nobody wanted to do work in the South. It was a lost cause. Louisiana was a lost cause. Nonprofits could not get money to do criminal justice work in Louisiana. It was, it was considered to be flushing money down the toilet. And funders would tell you this flat out, you know, not like with scorn, but just, I, you know, I can't get my board to approve this. And they'd rather, you know, look for their lost contact under the streetlight rather than where they lost it. You know, and so people would put the money where, where, where it's sort of like easy to do the work or at least seemingly. So, you know, in California or New York City or other parts of, of, of the country would get all this energy and all these activists and, and these firms and then places where folks were really struggling, particularly down south, you know, there's just, you know, I mean, now people know of, of Brian Stevenson and EJI and, and, and the great work, uh, Equal Justice Initiative, the great work that, that's come out of that shop, um, which really started around the life without parole issue for, for children. Uh, but, you know, continually, we see that across the south, we've been growing these, these things. And so, uh, we've got to a point now where so virginia for example they have they historically were one of the the few states along with florida and iowa and um uh kentucky who had a, a voting rights death penalty basically you know once you got convicted forget about it you're never going to vote again and you know there might there's you know this like really slim pardon where you've got millions of people who are impacted and yet you're, you're, you're restoring voting rights for like hundreds, you know? So clearly you, you can only imagine uh, how, how much you got to squeeze in to get, um, to get in on, on that situation. So along with the pressure of impacted people and the, the bubbling rise of folks understanding the broader issues we've kind of been talking about how you know, you've locked up so much of America and stripped all these rights and excluded people. And, you know, so this wave that we've been really generating over the last, you know, 10, 20 years uh, has influenced a lot of folks. And so in Virginia, you know, a series of executive orders have re-enfranchised thousands of people. Similarly in Kentucky, um, there's actually, there's a, uh, Vir Virginia just passed a, um, uh, a constitutional amendment in their legislature, but they didn't pat like so. Process, you know, is is really important to know because you get um, for them they have to pass it like twice over two years, and then it goes to the ballot for the people to vote. So some of these processes, I mean, you can't just change the constitution sort of like overnight, right? Which is usually a good thing. Uh, California restored voting rights through the ballot. Uh, I want to say last year for people on parole. Um, uh, Iowa's governor has made a big change. Um, Oregon has a, has a bill up right now uh, to make a change that would expand uh, to, to people that are in prison as well. Um, and New York in 2018, the governor expanded to, to people on parole. And Connecticut now has uh, some momentum for a bill, I believe, this year for a, about 11,000 people who are in the community supervision. And Minnesota and Georgia both, uh, you know, have a lot of activism right now. And there is sort of an end in sight, but uh, that's it. Now, I'll just, I want to get to some Q&A, but I'll just say, too, that you, people probably have heard of the, um, the, the HR1 bill in Congress. 
So the interesting thing about that is, and this has been talked about before with the, the, the Democracy Restoration Act that we've, we've tried to kind of push here and there, is that they can create a federal right to vote and that would give, let's say, everyone a, 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 the right to vote in all of the federal elections. And the thinking is, because the feds really subsidize a lot of state elections, and so if they require you to, it would be un, it would be unmanageable for a state to have to juggle these two voting rights standards. Like, oh, Chico, you can vote in all the federal elections, but you can't vote in the state ones. And now I got to like stagger my elections to, to sort of deal with that. So the thinking is by giving pe people a federal right to vote, and this would be for all people who are on a community supervision, um, it wouldn't include the people in prison, but it would be all people on probation and parole. Uh, it would be a game changer to kind of really continue trying to smooth this thing out. And we could talk, we have a bill that's coming up that would smooth out Louisiana as well. Uh, but definitely want to pause here and, and hear what, what folks are thinking or wondering. Yeah, we would we would love to hear from some folks. Um, I know we've had like a couple of comments and stuff in the questions. Um, I just linked Vote NOLA's uh, legislative, um, upcoming legislative list, and this is for Louisiana. Is there a good website for um, everything that you just mentioned, like what the up and coming um, state by state breakdown? What's the best website for that? I think the two people who do the best work would be the Brennan Center or the Sentencing Project. Oh. Okay, great. And one yeah. might be ahead of the other at any given point in time, but they usually both try to like keep it all together. One might be a little more user friendly than the other. Plus, <clears throat> plus they keep you up to date about what's going on and everything. While Bruce is showing, you know, uh, you know, Brendan Center and Center, you know, they they're going to give you the facts and uh, you know keep you up to date with what's going on. So uh, on the Q and A, uh, somebody says, "Oh, okay, I, I didn't realize that uh, when somebody said here about Mitch McConnell's wife and all of that." You know, well, that that is nothing new, ladies and gentlemen. That is nothing new. That the person said Mitch McConnell's wife and his family know a lot about shipping drugs. Her reward was a cabinet position. Hey, that's how it goes, you know. And she gave forty-three million dollars to Harvard which they would gladly accept blood money uh, everywhere else is among the elite institution in America. And, and that's how it goes, ladies and gentlemen, that is how it goes, you know, that uh, the powder and the, and the crack, that's what I was talking about, the war on drugs with Clinton. Uh, all of this got started with that. And then when you read the, the Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow, Jim Crow is nothing new. This is nothing new. They've always tried to find a way to disenfranchise people so they could vote and do what they want to do. Because if you're not part of the uh, voting, then uh, you have no say so and they get what they want and do what they want to do. So let's go to Q&A and uh, uh, as we said, let's get this party started. Yeah, please. Uh, if you all just um, you want to raise your hand, or or if you just feel like speaking, you know, or or type in chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, if anybody's got uh, a specific question they want to ask of Bruce and Chico, or 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 comment they want to make about the state, I know that um, in in chat we covered mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. Um, also, uh, yeah, we talked about HR one. We talked about double standards. Um, and then uh, I've dropped a couple more links. Oh, um, Joyce Thomas asked if you guys could offer uh, sort of like uh, a bullet points of actions or policies, like what would the top five steps in the right direction, like the top five things to do to enact this kind of change, just succinctly. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I. I think one of the most important things, and, and Chico is an, an, is an example of it, um, and, and I just don't think that Chico would do himself justice because he is a, a very humble man, um, but showing up and showing up and showing up, and you know, I think it's under, it's, nobody has any illusions about the, the composition of the Louisiana legislature for the most part. 
right? We understand kind of who goes, who's there. And if like, if you think that you're gonna like win something with just the sort of civil rights black legislators, they're outnumbered by far, right? And so, uh, so the, but we kept showing up and Chico kept showing up to the point where when our bill finally made it to the Senate side and this man stood up, Dan Clater, Republican Dan Clater was a former DA and was kind of the moral compass of the legislature. And he starts going off with some data about different states that I provided to somebody uh, that would show that Louisiana would be on the more liberal side than, than much of the country if they pass this. And we're just like, oh man, here we go. And, and then he started talking about, you know, people talking about the Saints players because we had gotten some Saints players to write some letters to support uh, for, the, for the bill. And he tells this story about how when people come to, to talk to him, you know, to meet with him, he, before he even sits down, he checks that they're registered voters or not. And he checks if they're voters. And so then if they disagree with something he's doing, you should do this, you should do that. He slides a voter registration form across the desk and he's like, I suggest you get registered and you vote against me. Right. He just flat out. And I, you know, I, 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 I can't disagree with, with sort of the, the, the strategy, I guess, from his perspective. And so he's talking about, he's like, he said, you know, I don't, I'm not up here for the saints. They're a great team and all. It's like, I'm up here for people like Chico and the people in the blue shirts, people who want to vote, but they can't. And in that moment, was when we knew that all of our hard work over time really was, was sinking in and paying off. And that s sailed through the Senate side, had to go back to the house for some technicalities and stuff, as you know. And, um, but it's those moments and it's really about showing up and it's about lifting up impacted people. And so one of the things that, that I think that, you know, any of us can all do, you know, whatever, you know, walk of life we're in is to be lifting up impacted people and, and helping them kind of get, get on the, on the podium, so to speak, or, or put the mic and hear them amplify our voices. You know, I'm saying from the third person, but like to really help us say what we need to do so that we can have those moments. Now imagine if Chico never spoke and if Chico never showed up and he was just a client and it was some fancy lawyer from Yale who was really saying why this is an important issue that needs to change. Would Dan Clater really have had that moment if he was listening to just some really intelligent lawyer about like where this, this law comes from? I highly doubt it. He didn't care about two New Orleans Saints players having their point of view. And so I think that is one of the most important things. And, and for those of us that are inclined, um, you know, it's important to really kind of learn the, the, the finer points of the current law and then what we need to try to change because we need more and more folks who can kind of get in the conversations depending on who you are, right? You might be someone who might work in a, in a registrar's office. Um, you might have a friend who who works for probation parole or at the DMV, which is you know a voting rights site under the National Motor Voter Law, and so like you you might have a lot to share in a conversation by knowing the finer points. Now, if that's not one's thing, don't kill yourself, right? But but if it is your thing, like we can kind of get into it. I was gonna say I can't oh. stress enough how much vote-nola.org kind of really like organizes this information and really provides a gateway to people helping. I mean, I just, I can't stress enough how good y'all's website as I'm discovering is, is just like about laying it all out and telling people how you can work. They even have like a great one sheeter that you can print out for the upcoming legislative stuff that's happening in Louisiana. It's, in, it's incredible. Um, Judy, We're hoping, uh, you know, Amanda, when we did that, uh, yeah. we found out that if you keep it on the, the eighth, you know, eighth grade level, so people can actually understand what's going on. You do a better job as as opposed to what Bruce was talking about the 
the attorneys and these legalese that know this case and can cite all that case and all that, you know. But if you keep it simple, simple that people can understand and they said, wow, this makes sense. You know, we, we, uh, we you know, in the legislature, when we go there, we do the one page or so the legislator that may be doing our bill and maybe the opposing people, they can actually read it and say, oh, you know what? This does make sense. Because if it makes sense, uh, what Bruce, uh, we had some top, <laughs> some top pastors in the state of Louisiana and national, I had letters to give uh, Senator Clayton. And he would never take that any of that. But every day when I would see him, I would say, hey, how are you going to vote? Man, I'd like to have my voting rights. And he was just, we didn't know how he was going to go. But showing up and understanding that you're only asking to have the right to vote. Or you're only asking to make it simple. You know, uh, you know, getting involved, you know, and I'm hoping that everybody that's on this webinar today uh, on this on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a holy weekend that when you leave here you will want to call our office get on our website our phone number is there and get involved to find out how can I change this how can I get involved to make life different for people not just for me, but for people. Because we're all seeing across America, and especially the times we're living in now, that people have to get involved. And as Amanda said, our website is just so simple. It gives you our history from the 1980s all the way up to today. Mm -hmm. When I said today, right up to today, because when we finish this, this will probably go up on the website and people can see this and understand. You know, we uh, do uh, VIP classes, teaching people how this goes. You know, we had a young lady named Rena. Rena had never been able to speak in public, but guess what? She was able to speak and stand up and said, hey, whose house? My house. And when I said that, we're talking about this capital. In the, in the legislature right here in Baton Rouge, whose house is it? It's our house. We send folks there. We pay the taxes. We do all of that. And when we understand that, then you not so much demand, but you tell the person, this is what I want. You know, we, we, we're involved in our C4 side of our organization in, in elections. We don't accept one penny from anybody. I'll see foresight. We sent a survey to the candidates. Tell us what you're gonna do for the community, not for uh, uh, Norris, not for myself, not for Bruce, not for Jen. We have two Jens in our organization, but what are you gonna do for the community? And you fill out that survey, then we make an intelligent decision as best we can that we're going to support this candidate, but we're going to remind you, this is what you said you're going to do for the people. Because I had to teach my past in my church that people running for office will come and shout and tell you, hey, I'm going I'm to set you free. I'm going to do all this and all that. And they leave. But they're human beings just like everybody else. And I had to learn that. You know, Bruce, all of us, we had to, you know, practice this, teach this, study this, and then we got to the point that you cannot be afraid to talk to an elected official. Mm -hmm. Because the real thing is he or she is an, what, an elected official. When they came to us asking for the vote, they were humans, right? So once we get elected, you're still that same human being. So you have to practice this, get involved, get involved, get involved. You know, I see somebody put in the chat about gerrymandering. That is a whole nother discussion. I doubt, does there, I don't even think everybody may understand what redlining and gerrymandering really is. So if you really did that history, it's just unbelievable, just right quick in West Feliciana Parish. 
what is the main source right in West Feliciana Parish? And I'm, I'm going to give you the chief sheet. It's Angola. 18,000 acres of 6,300 people in Angola. If you go down 61 and get to St. Francisville, they wow. have a brand new four lane highway. They have brand new hotels there. They have two brand new high schools and two brand new uh, elementary schools because gerrymandering, guess what? 6,000 people in Angola was more than the people that lived in the actual parish until we brought everybody's attention. Guess who they were counting? In West Feliciana Parish. Guess who they was counting? That had no say so. People that was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to look up what gerrymandering is, what redlining is, and you have to educate yourself. So, you know, I, I'm always under the impression that when people learn, they do better. Mm -hmm. When people learn, they do better. So when I'm looking at Sarah's face on there, I'm looking at Joyce's face, I'm looking at Judy's face, and I'm looking at, you're shaking your head, look like you're very interested. I would love and expect, and I'm using that term expect, you getting involved. And I mean, right now we're in COVID and everything, but hey, you know, text us, uh, uh, go to our website and really learn. And guess what? You are the voices that we need to change what we're in to get people become human beings, FIPs, and out paying taxes, working every day, and should have the right to vote. As this is entitled, who gets to vote? Who gets to vote? I think Judy's got her got her hand up. Yeah, Judy, go ahead. I think you're on oh. mute, Judy. There I have. Oh, here we go. Oh. Go ahead, Judy. You're good. Yeah, so I um, I actually have been to the legislature in Baton Rouge a few times. Uh, I used to work at the dental school, and we would go every year to uh, the for lobby day or whatever they call that. Uh, so we would go every year for that. And uh, I uh, have also gone to uh, lobby on behalf of uh, uh, sensible gun control. And um, I found two things. I found that the uh, legislators are, uh, if they don't want to, if they don't like your issue, they're somehow are not available. Hmm. They disappear. They're unavailable. Um, you know, when I went with like the uh, for the moms, the moms with sensible gun control, we had a big old bus, and they decided at the last minute to change the um, the hearing or whatever you call it, the the um, committee hearing. Mm -hmm. they, they did. <laughs> They, they did every, and you know, and, and it's not like everybody can go back the next day on this big old bus, right, from, from New Orleans. And we had moms from all over the, the state coming in. So that's really kind of been the, the difficult thing. I totally agree that you have to, have, and, and listen, I'm not shy at all. I'm, I'll talk to anybody about anything. But I found that the, um, it was just extremely difficult to make contact with um with legislators and of course they don't know me, me from Adam you know but um they didn't want to deal with some issues fluoridation issues uh that the dental community wanted to deal with and they didn't want to deal with sensible gun control issues so it was um you know it just was very very I I, I gotta tell you I really applaud you for having that consistent presence because that is what it takes um which boy you really have to it, it, it's a strong commitment. It's a strong commitment. You can't just go one time and think that you're going to make any kind of an impact because it doesn't work that way. It's the long haul. It's the perseverance. It's doing it again and again and again and never being uh, disheartened or discouraged. Mm -hmm. that, that's why Bruce mentioned, I'm going to put this shirt up right quick. You see this vote shirt? When he says, hey, the, those blue shirts show up, uh, you know, doing what I do is my job, okay? So I can afford to be there every day. 
And you're absolutely right. We've had our people uh, set to come from Shreveport, Lafayette, from New Orleans, from all around, and we footed the bill for them to get there. And you're absolutely right. The committee uh, chairman would realize, hold up, there's too many damn blue votes, blue shirts here, or too many red shirts, you know, mom, right, exactly. guess there's too much, too many green shirts, whatever you want to say, purple shirts. And they would actually put the bill off. Right, exactly. That is, that is why we teach people how to go on the website, how to track the bill, and everybody on this call, you can go on the legislative website if, uh, if a man can put it up, and you can track a bill. So you don't lose that time. That don't mean that when you go there that they're not going to change it or whatever. Some days this, your bill may not come up until 7 o'clock that evening. Right. And you've right. stayed there all day long. You got to get back for your children and all of that. But if you learn, it's not going to be perfect. It's like anything else. Uh, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Mm -hmm. So you have to get people there that's going to do it and, and stay persistent. Stay persistent. And, uh, you know, you know, you got something you want to change. So learn how to go on the, on the website of the legislature's website, track the bill that you're interested in. It's got a little eye to wink at you and, and you click that and every, wherever you got your phone, it, it, you know, it'll be on your phone. It'll be on everything. And guess what? You can track that. Just like Judy said, you know, they went there all day long and legislatures hide. They hide. Mm -hmm. But guess what we learned? We learned to stand in the hallway mm -hmm. by the cafeteria or by the elevator. And we would we would position people like that. So some sooner or later, you got to come out. Yeah. And when you come out, we're going to be there to present our issue. And that's what it was. It was persistent in being there because, uh, as you said, I can imagine you, Judy, your group is a lot different from our group. And if they hid from you, you don't think it's hiding from us? <laughs> <laughs> think about it. I mean, you know, I'm getting texts and stuff and stuff like that. But the thing about it is, hey, you have to be persist persistent and, you know, learn how to fight. But most of all, how many of you on this have actually spoke with your legislator? Know who your legislator, know who your state senator, and know who your state representative. And, you know, Bruce and I and Norris and all of our group, we've understood this for the last few years. You don't wait until the session to start right. to get to know these people. Right. Get to know your legislator early. You know, I mean, right now we're in COVID, so, you know, we, we would invite them to come to our meeting. We would have to go invite them for a cup of coffee, come by our office and talk about stuff. So you can't wait until the session. Right. Because then you're behind the eight ball because guess what? Lobbyists, lobbyists, right. lobbyists right. that want to do the damage to us as taxpayers. And I'm going to say that again. I'm a taxpayer now. Although I'm on parole, I pay my taxes. So therefore, we have to learn to fight the same game that they're fighting and be intelligent about what we want. You know, yeah. what do you want for your community? You know, I'm looking at Sarah. She's sitting back and she's paying attention, look like she's taking all of this in. So I'm hoping that everybody right now know one thing, who your state representative is, who your state senator is, and start making a getting a relationship with that person i met this past week a couple of days ago with someone we didn't even support we supported the other candidate but now this candidate realizes that vote is playing a major part in getting stuff done so they wanted the olive branch so we sit down and the bill that he wants to do now he's going to file a bill for education uh for, for men and women that's incarcerated if they get more education, they get good time credits. And that, that may not mean anything to anybody. Oh, that's a but, big deal. But think about it. If a, a person is in prison, they dumb and mean and all of that, but if they get an education and get classes and stuff, they're going to come out and be a better person. Right. So we sat down and had a conversation. But when we finished, guess what? He wants to support what we're doing 
because he needs our support now to get his bill done. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's done. It's so simple. It's again, showing up and, you know, I don't want to, you know, take up all the time and everything, but I'm hoping really does everybody on here know who your state representative is, know who your state senator is, and have a conversation with them. You can text them now, you can email them. Uh, and people right now want to be, they want their constituents to reach out to them. There's actually, um, there is a uh, find my legislators uh, for the state uh, website at the la.legislat.gov. There we go. And if you put your, if you also, if you put your information uh, into the the Secretary of State's Go Vote site, mm -hmm. you can all, it'll list out all of your different uh, elected officials and, and such. And I just want to add, you know, people, it was it was brought up that uh, you know that currently our site right now uh, ha our legislative corner is still the 2020. Uh, on the back end, we've been populating our bill tracker. Uh, we've got our one sheets ready for different bills, including kind of like the summary one of all the bills that we find to be important. And we're in the sort of the final stages of bills being filed. And so we're about ready to, to finalize sort of a, a relaunch of that information. I expect that to be coming this week. But the other thing is I encourage everybody to sign up for our, our newsletter, which you can do uh, through, through our website. And then similarly, if you, if you follow our social media, you know, we will always be putting out like the latest on different things. The legislative session is something that we, that we you know, we're, we're closely involved in and, you know, obviously around I mean, right now we're we're taking interest in about 20 different bills, uh, and you know some of them are our own, some are our comrades, some are the ones that 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 we want to stop, and it's uh, also important, kind of to to the points that that both Judy and Chico were making. Um, you know, our influence isn't just at the legislators, right? Our influence is also the other advocates, and to get those other groups and those other lobbyists to back our issues. And so that, for instance, if so-and-so is hiding from you, uh, maybe they don't hide from somebody else who's in your sphere. And you say, hey, can you carry this message, right? So our coalition work has been important as was just dropped in the chat, you know, between the power coalition or, you know, at one point we, we kicked off this Louisiana's for Prison Alternatives Coalition. Uh, you know, FICPFM is also a coalition, a national one. OPPRC uh, around the jail in, in Orleans, uh, the Baton Rouge Jail Coalition. So, you know, it's it's a way to, to really, um, you know, to use the, the various different strengths to cover up for some of our different weaknesses. And then collectively, we, we have that much more power. Uh, and one other thing I just wanted to, to, to let you all know, and, you know, and Chico's kind of alluded to it uh, with our C4, um, which is refer reference to a 501c4 organization, which can do political activity. Uh, and I don't know if, if any of y'all heard of the, the Know Your Vote campaign. Maybe you've seen like a billboard or something or a bus shelter that said like Know Your Vote endorses or the justice ballot. Um, we have another organization called Voters Organized to Educate. And that is designed to educate people about who's running for office their histories, you know, their answers to our survey, not just general put out what they want, but we want to, to lift up the things that we think are important around the race that they're running for. And then at times when it seems that there's, you know, a, a clear candidate to support, um, we'll, we'll endorse a candidate. And so we really lifted up that campaign in 2017 around the mayoral and city council races here in New Orleans. And we've expanded it out uh, a little bit each year. And last fall, we were heavily involved in the judicial and the DA race here in New Orleans, along with other races across the state. Uh, but you know, we had this justice ballot and we ended up doing qu quite well. And so as Chico is continually referencing, they want our voting block now. They didn't before, but now they do. And so that is a massive transformation of power. Yeah go from you previously sentenced me and now you're on bended knee asking me to, to support you. And you know, when Bruce, when Bruce says that we were involved in the marriage race in New Orleans, the city council races, judges races, think about this, judges races. 
<laughs> we actually put on our own forum. So if, that, if that's how they do it, we are learning to do the same thing. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking at you smiling like, wow, you know, but the thing about it is, uh, you know, with the sheriff's race, all of these people that would incarcerate people and, and, and house people in their prison, when they get ready to run for re-election, hey, can I get your vote? Well, now you got to tell us something that you're going to do to help the people, not me per se, you know, but to help the people. And that's how it's really done. And, you know, I'm looking at the League of Women Voters. We actually work with the League of Women Voters here in the Baton Rouge area, in the New Orleans area, the Shreveport area, all across, because we realize those are allies. Those are part of the coalition partners. Because what, what they can do, well, I'll put it this way. Judy can walk into a room and say something that as a former FIP person or just a regular black person, I can't walk in that room. But if you walk in that room and open the door and you say, yeah. let me bring my friend in here so he or she can explain this. Because what we have not spoke about and you know, these things come off the off our heads because there's so much information. We have not talked about females that's been incarcerated. That is a whole nother subject. Mothers, grandmothers, aunties, cousins. But look what you can do, Judy. Look what Sarah can do. When you walk in the door that I can't walk in, but we're speaking the same language, we get what? Some attention. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, Amanda, I hope I didn't go too long there. You know, no, it just, that, that's okay, Chico. It is we're passionate about this, okay? No, everything that you guys have said to be said today has been incredible. It's been informative. I know that the chat has been a link storm. I will do my best to get a list <laughs> of all the links that um, we all put in there today and post it on the Who Gets to Vote website, which is at archives.nolalibrary.org. And I'll try to make sure that, like, I grab all our links, put it together in a list and plug it later um, in this week. Um, I did want to thank everybody for coming out today, especially Bruce and Chico. Like it's been massively informational, even more like it's been an incredible journey. And I think we you've given us like so much information to work on. And thanks to your organization, so many direct avenues to participate now. Vote-NOLA.org is an incredible resource, as well as everything else that we've linked today. Um, I want to ask one question before we get to, to how many of, of, of people that's on this can I get to count on to go to our website and actually join and get our newsletter and become involved? How many? See, that's what this is all about, to bring in new people that can bring different ideas I don't have all the answers, okay? I have a lot of questions, but I don't have all the answers. Seriously, I mean, uh, I, I would I would be remiss and Bruce will jump on me later and Norris will jump on me, our leaders. You know, we're looking for new people to come in with new ideas that can, that have different, come from different cultures, you know, to do things. So uh, I think I looked at a few people, so Amanda, uh, you got all these information. They can put the information in the chat. Uh, we gave them our website. So we have our first meeting uh, Wednesday on the 7th since they've list, lifted the restriction. We're not going to be 100, 200 people, but we're going to be doing it live and streaming and all that online. So I would love for you, you ladies and gentlemen, the new people on here now, to get involved this Wednesday, the 7th. We're gonna we're gonna have our meeting right there in New Orleans. We have our building on um, on Washington 4930 Washington Avenue. But you can join online and get information. So I am gonna take you up on that to get involved. So Amanda, I hope I didn't go step out of bounds. But uh, with all this that we're doing, who gets the right to vote? Who gets the vote? Get involved. Find out because there's a lot of other stuff that goes along with this. Does that make sense, everyone? The the meeting info for uh, the seventh is on the website, Chico. Uh, yeah, 
I'm, I don't know whether it's up yet, Bruce. Uh, they've well, been you know, so we're, we because of uh, you know capacity limits, we're actually it's it's a it's a sign up situation, you know, and so we we it's I don't want I don't want to use the word experimental, you know, but we're we're trying to to do something um, new that we haven't done before, and you know, previously we've done like the big old Zoom, and right. so now we're gonna we're gonna try something something else this April uh the, you know next week which will you know it'll be i want to say we're looking at about like 50 to 60 people um and we have a good size big community space and everything else um but certainly i'm not sure if there's like a, a, a particular sign up for the meeting on the site but if you if you email us and if you you know would like to uh, you know definitely we would see if i don't know if it's like closed off yet or not but i know that we're having like specific like kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people because yeah. you know people want to be in person being in a 50 person in-person meeting seems almost unthinable at, yeah. at this point in history and the reality you know i mean so a lot of our folks are are, are older um you know right. or teachers or healthcare or whatever so you know i do think we have a really high vaccination rate uh thus far for our, our base people and our staff. Um, so, you know, myself included. And so I, I think, you know, that's obviously people are gonna vote with their feet as well and right. decide whether, you know, how safe they feel. Can you all repeat the time of the meeting again? It's always a, uh, it's always a six to 7.30 type of thing. And now with our new building, we've got this new fancy kitchen with six burners on the stove. So we're excited to, to really be able to start providing food in the way that we've always envisioned for our, you know, for our meetings rather than kind of bring it in with sort of the catering trays type thing, like fresh off, you know, fresh off the, out the, out the oven kind of thing. And Chico apparently is an award-winning barbecue guy. So, I mean, when he said how to eat an elephant, I mean, I would like to say with some hot sauce and some... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Bruce and Chico, I just really want to thank you for being here and joining us today. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you for the work that y'all do. Uh, and also everyone else here, uh, thank you so much for your participation in these four discussions. And Amanda, thank you so much for the work that you've done to put these together. I think Amanda really deserves a round of virtual applause yeah. uh, from everyone. <laughs> you put and, in the work. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm just so glad that you invited me to be a part of this. And it's been a really special experience. And I've, I've learned so much through these four weeks. Well, thank you for inviting us in the back and forward and the back and forward. See, everybody don't know what goes on in the background. I was thinking earlier when the lady Joyce was talking about, uh, 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 Judy was talking about missing a legislative. We had this meeting to get together and prepare for this and, and what we were going to talk about. And, and we finally couldn't do that. <laughs> so we, we got together today and guess what it came out it came from the heart you know yeah. it came from what we do you know we could have practiced this and then uh we might not have got everything in but you know we we do this all the time and and you know it's uh you know it's, it's great to be here thank you for having us thank you for inviting it. and i hope again i hope we made some new friends some new allies i think so some people that will come and say, you know, I want to help with this. Mm -hmm. I've never been, a, I never had anybody incarcerated. I never, I don't know anybody or whatever, but I want to be involved in this because this looks like a movement that I can be involved with. We want you to be involved. Mm -hmm. So my boss, my, my boss, Bruce, okay, I, I got to see him later. So, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I get that in and, and do what we do. I'll put our email addresses in for anybody to want to email us personally and everything, but go to our website. Uh, I think uh, Amanda put our website up early, and if it needs to be put in again, uh, uh, we can type it in and make sure that you do it. And somebody says, are we connected to Trinity? Yes, I am uh, here in Baton Rouge. I am uh, with the Episcopal Church here. Uh, in fact, uh, I know some of the people there, Charles Degavels, and you know they've actually they were they were part of my 
coming home group that helped me, you know, when I came out of prison. And so that's the other side. When you come out of prison, uh, I have that $10 check on my wall that they gave me. And when I went to cash the check, the check cashing place wanted me to buy their ID and wanted to charge me $6 to cash a $10 check. So uh, I'm looking at your mouth open, Beverly, but guess what? Then if you don't, guess what? How do you make it after you cash your check? You know, so that all those things we're involved in, get involved and I could go on and on, but hey, thank y'all for inviting us, Lowe. Thank you, Amanda. And by the way, Laf Lafayette wouldn't even put this book in their library. I saw that you guys had that in your blog a while back. And I oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you all for that. No, it was, it was it, Lafayette really, I don't know. They, they made a lot of decisions about this program, but luckily they were able to present it at the university library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're working on Lafayette. You know, <laughs> we'll get there, you know. One, one, one Cajun recipe at a time. We'll get there. <laughs> well, Thank you so much for having us. You know, we, we love these opportunities to, to meet and talk with people and, and, and share what, what we've learned and, and also hear you know, y'all's questions and, you know, kind of what you're thinking about and it helps guide our work as well. So really appreciate showing up and, and, and being present. I mean, we can't thank you enough for the hard work that y'all are doing and, and especially to come, come here and like, you know, uh, tell us and put it in context for all of us to really sort of explain what's been going on, what's happening and where we go next. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been, well, we love our libraries. <laughs> it's a, it's a, for those that's been locked up, the library is, is, is like the universal kind of church, you know, it's the temple. It's I the place. To send books to a couple of people at Angola. We did have people sign up. And um, my hope is that we followed all the rules for labeling the package right, because one of them got returned. And then we called them and they said, well, you need to do this. And I'm like, well, that's exactly what we did. Yeah. But she still sent it back. Well, you have to understand, uh, prison is not 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 about letting information in, and they will censor it and do what they need to do. But uh, we we send stuff up, and they they reject. And I was in prison, so I know the rules of how how you send stuff in and everything. But it depends on who's working that day. <laughs> in the mail room, in the mail room, it depends on who's working that day. But when we're talking about prison, but think about the joy that's over the postal services out here. Mm -hmm. Just think about that, you know? So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lo, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, everybody that's here and listening, okay? Thank you, everybody. Thank all you right. so much. Oh, okay. bye, Kitty. <laughs> all right, have a great weekend. Yeah. Stay safe. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And we will, oh, wait, before you go, well, if you didn't see it, um, one last thing is LEH wants you to fill out that survey. Let me drop that one more time. Um, if you guys don't mind uh, taking a peek at it on your way out. It might have some questions about the book, but don't worry about that. I think we got a lot of great information today. And that's the link to the survey. But that being said, I, I too want to thank everybody again, and um, I can't wait to see what sort of work y'all do in the future. And I'll be, I'll be, I'm on your mailing list now, so I'm going to participate when I can. I think it's incredible, and I think you guys are really well organized and have done incredible work already. So. And we will keep reminding you to participate, not when you can, okay, but soon, okay, very soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Adios. Let.